the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now the question here is, what end? The end of what? So today I'm going to do another really, really quick video. I'm going to talk about uh, he who endures to the end shall be saved and when is the end of the age. This is, um, these are verses or phrases taken from Matthew chapter 24 and people have interpreted them in a lot of different ways and I used to think about them in the ways that I had been taught before and it's really, really important that we get our words right, that we understand the scriptural meaning of words and that we use the meaning that the scriptures attach to it and that we don't sort of apply our own definition to the meaning of the words. So for example, in Matthew 24 when the disciples asked, when will these things be? That is, when will Jerusalem be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Okay, the sign of Jesus coming there, he's not talking about the rapture, okay? He's talking about Jesus' parousia, his coming as the Messiah. And what the disciples understood is that when the Messiah came, he would bring in the Messianic age. So that would then you know, put an end to this present age. So, you know, a lot of us were sort of taught to think about the ages, the dispensations of how God operated with men as, you know, the ages that are being talked about here. There is no such thing in the Bible as the age of grace. You will never find that phrase. It's never in there anywhere. Okay, grace has existed from the time of basically Adam and Eve, and it will exist uh for eternity. I mean, there's grace. There's grace that's always, and mercy that's being extended by God. And it's only by grace that we will actually be in heaven and we stand in the grace of God, the grace and mercy of God, even in eternity. That's why Jesus appears as the lamb. He is still the lamb carrying the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side to demonstrate that the price has been paid for us for our salvation. So the end of the age, we're not talking about the end of the age of grace. We're not talking about the end of the church age. Okay, the church age, you know, as defined by beginning at Pentecost and, you know, a lot of people will end the church age at the time when the tribulation begins. Okay, all of, all of that stuff is is pretty much fantasy and it's not scripturally supported. But what I'm going to give you today are some things that are scripturally supported. I'll give you the verses. I'm just going to include the verses in the show notes. I don't really have any notes for this show, but I am going to include the verses. So when we talk about ages in the Bible, when the Bible talks about ages, we have what's called the present age. This present age. Paul talks about this present age. And what these, uh, what the Jewish people understood is that when this present age ended, that there would be you know, what we call the millennium, but what they called the day of the Lord. Okay, the day of the Lord would last a thousand years. And we read about that in Second Peter uh, chapter 3. But do, do not overlook this one fact. Okay, one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Okay, so we're talking about the millennium here and we can see that in the verses that follow. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, that is, the end of the age hasn't happened yet, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That is, when the millennium comes, that thousand year day, that one year is as a day and a day is a thousand years, that it's going to come in like a thief going to come in like a thief. People will not know when that happens. Now, a lot of people have associated that with something they call the tribulation. The rapture will happen, and then this, you know, day of the Lord, wrath of God thing will start that, you know, they believe is seven years long and so on. But the day of the Lord is going to come like a thief, and the day of the Lord is its own day, okay? And according to Peter, it's a thousand years long. So this present age is 6,000 years uh, long, okay, ish. When the day of the Lord starts, it's 1,000 years long, and it's also called the day of Christ, okay? And Peter also talks about how this day is going to come in like a thief, 
and it's going to end with the heavens passing away with a roar. Okay, then the heavens will pass away with a roar. The heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. And since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Okay, when... When is everything going to be destroyed and melted and burned and we have a new heavens and a new earth? It's at the end of the millennium, okay, just a little bit afterward. So this is when the day of God will begin. Everything is going to be dissolved, okay? It's going to be dissolved and burned by fire. Okay, so uh, Paul talks about the coming ages, so there, there isn't just one age um, that's to come. When, once this present age is over, there's coming ages. Now, there are some people I've heard that teach that the millennium and the new heavens and the new earth is all going to be kind of one thing. But Paul is clear that there is more than one age to come. And that's in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages... He might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So right now we're in this present age and there is the age to come right here, the thousand years. And there are coming ages, including this uh, day of God, which is eternity. This day of the Lord will come in like a thief in the night and it will exit when everything is dissolved. So Peter just sort of jumps over that whole millennium. He tells us it's a thousand years. It'll come in like a thief and it will end when the heavens and earth are dissolved and God makes a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, so we know that this, this day of the Lord is a thousand years long. It'll come in like a thief in the night. We know that when it comes in, when the day of the Lord comes, that it's going to come as a surprise to some people, and uh, not us, though. It's not going to be a surprise to us. We, we're, all, we're already going to know about it. But it's going to come at the end of this present age. The disciples in Matthew 24 were asking, when was this age going to end and the next age begin? And what they wanted was like a sign. What's the sign that that's going to happen? And so uh, people will talk about the, you know, the wars and rumors of wars and, you know, false Christ and so on and so forth. But it's very clear what that sign is. And it's in Matthew 24, 29 and 30, even uses the word sign. Talks about immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay, that's the events that are associated with the sixth seal. That's the sign that Jesus is about to begin the day of the Lord. Okay, so we'll, let's just put sixth and seventh seal. That's the, the events associated with it are the sign that Jesus is coming back. Okay, and they're not the sign of the rapture. We're not talking about the rapture here. And in this instance, we're talking about the sign of Jesus coming to begin the millennial reign. And he says this uh, sun will be darkened. The moon will not give its light. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Verse 30, then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Okay, so that's when Jesus comes. There will be a sign in the heavens and I believe that's six seal sort of stuff when um, the people who are on the earth will see uh, God and Christ in heaven and they're going to go hide in the, their hidey holes and um, ask for the rocks to fall out on them because the great day of the Lord has come. Okay, the great day of of their wrath, the wrath of the Lamb and, and of God has come. 
I'm not quoting that exactly right, but it's along those lines. Okay, so we know that the sixth and seventh seal are the sign that the day of the Lord is about to begin. I've done numerous videos on the day of the Lord. It's a very clear passage, very clear doctrine in scripture. It's not anything that is fuzzy. It's really clear how it's all laid out here. Okay, so there's another passage in uh, Matthew 24 that I think is really important to look at. Okay, and that's Matthew 24, 9 through 13. It's talking about the, the believers who endure to the end will be saved. Okay, and we're talking about those believers who endure to the end of the age right here, this end right here. Okay, when the new um, age begins. Okay, remember the new age is going to begin with the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is going to begin at the very first part of the millennium. And obviously this is not to scale. In fact, the wrath of God that starts this millennium uh, at this, you know, with the sign being the sixth and seventh seal is will probably only last, you know, we're talking a very short period of time, less, less than a year, probably uh, less than months, even maybe even only weeks. And it's the bowls, the seven bowl judgments. Okay. But the millennium, the thousand years will have already started. It comes in like a thief and then it will leave when uh, it'll end when everything is dissolved. So the disciples were, you know, wanting to know about the end of the age. And Jesus talks about how the, there's going to be people, Christians, believers, who are delivered up to tribulation, and they're going to be put to death. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And he's not talking about the Jews here. He's talking about people who are put to death um, and hated by all nations because of Jesus, okay, for his name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, okay? And we're talking about believers here who are going to fall away, believers who will betray one another and hate one another. And I think that if we're talking about the great falling away um, of believers, this would be it. There's going to be a very clear delineation between those who are um, believers who are going to keep on trusting and believing in Jesus, even though it's going to cost them, it's going to maybe cost them their life. And there will be other people who fall back, who, who uh, turn in their fellow Christians, fellow brothers and sisters, and actually hate their fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This is a really, really bad time. And I think this is mostly associated with uh, fifth seal things when um, people there will be martyred for their faith. And verse 11, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And I think, again, that's during that particular time of persecution and tribulation. We're talking about persecution. Tribulation is hard times, persecution, stress. And it's during the end times here. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. This is really bad stuff. But verse 13, the one who endures till the end will be saved. Now the question here is, what end? The end of what? Um, if you endure to the end of what, you'll be saved. Okay, and that word saved can also mean rescued. Jesus is talking about the end of the age. If you endure to this point in time, just before the new age begins, just before that time of wrath begins, you will be saved. You'll be delivered. Okay, you'll be rescued. All right, so there is a rapture that's associated with this day. Okay, this is the end of the age. Okay, if you endure to the end, that is, believers who are going to be here during this time of really bad tribulation, you will be rescued before the wrath of God is poured out. Okay, so this is when the third rapture happens. Now, most people don't realize there's three raptures that the book of Revelation talks about. Paul really only talked about one, and that's this one right here. Um, it's the third one that begins before the day of the Lord. Uh, that 
but before the day of the Lord can begin, before the Lord can come, there actually has to be um, a, an abomination. The man of sin has to appear. That I'll, I would, I'm just putting that right there. Okay, so there's all kinds of events that are associated with the um, the end of this age and the coming of the new age of the day of the Lord or the day of Christ. So this is the third rapture that's going to take place. This is on a day nobody knows. It comes like a thief in the night. Uh, the book of Revelation, like two times, I think, mentions the thief in the night. And it's associated with the second coming of Christ and the, the beginning of the wrath of God and so on. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 that talks about the thief in the night. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 talks about how the, the coming of the Lord, which is this, it's not the rapture. Um, before the coming of the Lord comes, there has to be uh, the man of sin appearing uh, before the day of the Lord can begin. That's this right here. Okay, and remember the day of the Lord is a thousand years long. Okay, so this is the, the third rapture. The second rapture is going to be before the abomination. That's the 144,000. They get raptured. And before the seals are opened or anything like that, we have the first rapture. And that's, um, that's the male child of Revelation chapter 12, who's... Uh, born. That's when believers who are going to, you know, basically qualify as priests and kings, they're called chosen and faithful, and they will be taken into that first rapture and where they act as assistants to Christ for the for the rest of the stuff that goes on um, during the bad times that are here on earth up until he Christ returns. Okay, and the actual second coming is right here at, um, at the end of the wrath, uh, at the end of the seven bowls. So, okay, and that, that's the time of the seventh trumpet. Also, when the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Okay, so that's, um, so that's how that goes. So I'm expecting um, a rapture for me, uh, sometime soon, sometime in the next year or so. And then there's going to be a new group of believers, a new kind of apostolic group of um, the gospel goes back to the Jews again to, to give out, and that's the 144,000 of Israel. And they will be taken before that hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. That's the sixth trumpet right here. That's when World War III happens. I talked about that in the video right before this one. But I just wanted you to understand about ages. We're not in the church age. That's not a thing in the Bible. We're not in the age of grace. That's not a thing either. Okay, there's this present age that the Bible talks about. Paul talks about the coming ages, that in the coming ages, God would continue, Christ would continue to show us the immeasurable riches of his grace. So that will be uh, during the millennium and then on into eternity after everything's been dissolved and we have a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, so the end of the age is when the new age of the day of the Lord, the day of Christ, the millennium, when that begins. Okay, those who endure to the end that is the end of the age, but it isn't necessarily the end of the events that we see in Revelation. So the uh, bold judgments, for example, will begin, you know, at the beginning of the millennium. They'll take up this very short period of time, and then there's going to be a thousand years of peace on the earth. Uh, Christ is going to rule with a rod of iron. He's going to enforce peace. There aren't going to be any wars during that period of time for that thousand years. And then shortly after that thousand years are over, that's when Satan is released. And he gathers disgruntled people um, who still have a sin nature, who don't love Jesus. And I think there's going to be so many of them um, that people are going to be very surprised at how many people are not going to want to be under the rule of God or the rule of Christ. And so that's a way for the Lord to sort of filter out those people who do not want to go into eternity with God and with Jesus. Then those people will be um, destroyed by fire from heaven and then uh, great white throne judgment right here. 
great white throne judgment and that's when everybody's um, sort of eternal destiny is uh, permanently decided, especially for those people who were alive during the millennium. Okay, not everybody who is alive during the millennium who appears before the great white throne is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Some of those people have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. If they love Jesus, why would they be thrown into the lake of fire? But they're not saved people, okay, because this present age is when people are saved by faith. Okay, and once you see Christ, that is, faith isn't working anymore. You see him. There's no need to have faith. But still... These people will love Jesus, and so, you know, they're not going to be thrown into the lake of fire. So there's a passage in 2 Timothy, I think, um, 4, that says that Christ Jesus is the Savior of all men, especially of those who believe. He's our Savior, those of us who believe in him by faith and are destined to rule and reign with Christ, to be his bride in eternity. And there are um, other people who are saved, they're saved by the blood of Jesus, just like we are. But um, for whatever reason, they're not Christians. They they didn't hear the gospel or they lived during the millennium and God put their name in the book of life. The blood of Christ covers the whole world. Okay. And it's for everybody. Not that everybody will be saved. They won't be. But it's effective. It's efficacious for the salvation of everyone. So people who are saved who believe in Jesus, not by faith, but because they see him and love him and serve him, they are people who have their name in the Lamb's Book of Life and they'll be granted access to the Holy City. Uh, the New Jerusalem won't be their home. They'll live on the new earth. They'll be the guests um, in eternity after the New Jerusalem comes down from heaven from God to the new earth. After she's been fully assembled in heaven, she'll return um, to this new earth. There'll be people living on the new earth who will be uh, granted access to the New Jerusalem. There'll still be kings and nations and um, kind of things like you see today, only no sin, no sickness, no death, no sorrow, no sighing, no crying, uh, no depression no anxiety, nothing that troubles us today in this world, no broken relationships. Everything is going to be the way um, God is. And God is love. He is joy. He's peace. He's um, um, provision. He is everything. And all of that that God is will be part of our experience in eternity. And one of the things that I particularly love about God is how immensely creative he is. The beauty that um, still exists in a fallen world. I mean, this world is kind of like a garbage dump, and yet there's so much beauty in the world, even every day. It's just marvelous. And how God is um, concerned with the most minute, microscopic, subatomic, um, whatever. I mean, he, he sees the smallest, smallest, all the way out to the biggest, biggest. And he holds everything in motion. Okay, Jesus holds all of this world. It's all held together by him. So, the, you know, when we get to eternity... We are not going to be bored. Let me tell you, we will not be bored. We will be in totally in our element. We'll be doing the things that we were always meant to do, but for whatever reason in this life, you know, we just stumbled along. Every uh, desire of our heart that is of God is going to be maximized and will be ever expanding. God is always getting bigger and bigger. Um, not, I mean, he fills everything. And so that aspect of, of an ever expanding world of, you know, understanding and knowledge and joy and relationships and, um, you know, creativity and connections and all of this stuff is a part of what we've been promised. I really encourage people, please, um, get rid of some of those old traditions you've been hanging on to. Um, it's taken me uh, at least five years to undo uh, the traditional teaching that I've had. And 
to finally be able to, you know, see some of this stuff in a more clear way. And I think that's how God does things. You know, it's been a discipling process for me. And, you know, when Jesus came the first time and he called, you know, Peter and James and John and so on, he was calling them not as believers. He was calling them as people to, uh, who are willing to learn something new. They were disciples. He was the teacher and they were being called to learn something new. But in the process of learning the new things about the kingdom that Jesus would teach them, they had to get rid of all of that old rabbinic teaching. It took years for Jesus to basically get rid of the leaven of that bad teaching that came from the scribes and Pharisees. He had to get rid of that leaven in their life, and they had to be willing to get rid of it. So that finally, on the night that um, they had the Last Supper, finally they came to the place of confessing that they believed that Jesus came from God, that he was sent from God, and that the message that they'd received from him was from God. So it took basically three and a half years for these 12 men who lived with Jesus every day uh, to be um, unindoctrinated. And personally, I think that's what the job of the two witnesses is uh, right now. I think they're here right now. I think we're not going to see them because they're busy unindoctrinating the people who are going to be among the 144,000 of Israel, plus uh, the people who may not qualify for the 144,000 because they don't receive Christ, but when they see the abomination that causes desolation, they will realize that they will have already been taught that when this is going to happen, when they see it, they need to get ready to flee into the wilderness. So um, the, uh, the indoctrination is heavy. And even among really good, wonderful, God-fearing, you know, Christian pastors and teachers, um, you know, you go to seminary or Bible college, it's indoctrination school. That's where you're going to get the traditions of the fathers. And there's nothing that's different between our generation and the people who are living at the time of Christ. So let me know what you think about this video. Leave a comment in the comment section. We'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.